Welcome to this lesson and introduction to wind atlases. My name is Jake Badger and I'm head of section for resource assessment and meteorology at DTU Wind. So the learning objectives here are that after this lesson you will be able to explain why assessing wind conditions is important, explain what features impact airflow and wind conditions at a wind farm site, and explain the differences between meter scale and microscale effects. You will also be able to identify different wind atlases. So here we have a picture of a wind turbine in a landscape. And you might be wondering what, what do we need to know about wind conditions in order to, to put this wind, this wind turbine in the right place and to put in the right wind turbine? Well, the first thing we might be interested in is the wind speed at the hub height of the wind turbine. And that's important because that determines the production of the turbine. So, Every wind turbine has a power curve, and with that power curve, we can relate the wind speed at the hub height to a power production of the turbine. So if we know the annual distribution of wind speeds at that hub height, at that location, we can work out the annual production of the wind turbine. So the first thing we would like to know about the wind conditions of a wind turbine site is the annual wind speed distribution. Now, the annual wind speed distribution changes with height and with location. So as we move, for example, the hub height of this turbine with a bigger tower, for example, there'll be a different wind speed distribution. And if we move the tower to a different location in the landscape, there will also be a different wind speed distribution. So these things together will also mean a change to the annual production estimates. There's more to wind conditions than just to look at the wind turbine production. It will also influence the, the design aspects of the wind turbine. So for example, we're very interested to know about the extreme winds, as indicated by this red arrow with a big exclamation mark. So to know about the wind, uh, extreme winds, this would be, for example, to know what is the 50-year uh, return wind influencing the site. And this can affect the extreme loads on the wind turbine. We're also interested to know about the level of turbulence around the turbine site. So we're interested in the turbulence intensity as indicated by these more wiggly lines. And these are conditions that impact the design of the turbine because of fatigue loading. We need to be able to understand and quantify atmospheric flow around a wind turbine site in order to make better site choices, i.e. to increase the production by sensible uh, decisions about the placement and hub height, for example. And we need to be able to use information about the atmospheric flow to make better design choices about the turbine in order to reduce costs. Just to put this into perspective, last year there was a global installation of wind of 94 gigawatts. And this is approximately equal to around 40,000 turbine sites. All of those sites need to be assessed in some way in order to know about the feasibility of the wind farm uh, site and project. One way we can address this big need for understanding and quantifying the conditions is to use modeling. This slide shows the model chain we use and this model chain allows us to do meteorology at different scales. We start with the global scale with global modeling where we have from the weather centers around the world, decades long estimates of the state of the atmosphere. This is very useful for our purposes, but it's just the start point. The reason it's the start point is because the, the, most, uh, the smallest resolved features in this kind of modeling are around 30 to 100 kilometers in size. So this isn't, uh, we cannot use this directly in a resource assessment. So the next thing we do is go to mesoscale modeling and these are the kinds of models that are used in weather centers to produce the daily weather forecasts. Here we can see that we're starting to resolve interesting features relevant for wind conditions at a turbine site. We're seeing um, smallest features about one to 10 kilometers in size. Um, for example, we can see the variation of wind speed here during the day. We can see interesting gap flow occurring um, here. And we can also see an extreme event, which is a hurricane moving over, over 
the Gulf of Mexico. But still, this isn't high enough resolution to be able to make a, a good resource assessment or assessment of wind conditions. We need to go to the micro scale. And the micro scale, we're, we're able to resolve features down to tens of meters and uh, one kilometer or so. Um, and here we see, um, for example, a hilltop where tur turbines have been placed and the resources are good here because of effect due to speed up over hills, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, so all of these components are needed in our model chain in order to get to the resolution required for a good wind resource or wind condition estimation. This slide shows you what I call snapshots of, of the mesoscale wind features. And it's provided by synthetic aperture radar, which can be processed in order to give us wind speed estimates over the sea, over water. And um, I think these are quite fascinating because you can see, for example, enhanced wind speeds um, occurring in gap flows. So here we've got um, Corsica and Sardinia and in enhanced wind speeds uh, happening after that gap. Um, here we have the Canary Islands and we can see um, reduced wind speeds in the wake of the islands and we can also see speed up happening on the shoulders of the islands and also some slowdown ahead of the islands. And then we have a case of uh, the flow around Norway and Denmark. Here we see the high elevation of Norway and the low elevation of Denmark and we see quite a different nature of the flow around those uh, two countries. So one way to understand better about how the flow will interact with terrain is to look at this quantity called the Froude number. The Froude number is the ratio between the inertial and the buoyancy effects in the flow. And the important things about the, the, the important parameters in the Froude number are the velocity scale, the height of the obstacle, and this could be a hill or a mountain, for example, and the brunt visor frequency, which is a measure of the atmospheric stability. So when we have a fruit number smaller than one, we see that the flow tends to go around uh, mountains and hills, and we see more of the gap flow features, more of these um, island uh, wakes and island um, speed ups on the shoulders of islands and so on. Um, and that can happen in this schematic when we have a, a typical um, brunt vasler frequency, um, a wind speed of 10 meters per second, and a hill that is greater than 1,000 meters, more like a mountain. Um, so this is a bit like what we saw in the photos, uh, the, the scenes, the star scenes of Corsica and Sardinia, um, of uh, the Canary Islands, and also the flow around Norway. Um, whereas when we have a fruit number larger than one, we can see that schematically here, where we've kept the brunt visor frequency the same, the wind speed's the same, but we've reduced the height of the hills. So now we've got a hill lower than 1,000 meters. So we've got a brunt a, a, a fruit number larger than one, and we see that the, um, the flow is able to go over the terrain undisturbed or less disturbed. And that's more like what we see um, over the flow over Denmark. So another important um, impact um, of the terrain and uh, landscape on the uh, winds is um, due to the surface roughness length. And here we have a graph which shows how the wind speeds reduce as we get closer to the surface. So it's the effective height on this scale and the wind speed on this axis. Imagine here that we have a wind speed of 10 meters per second aloft. And um, what we're seeing here is the change of the wind speeds as we approach. The first case is over the sea, and we see this rather slow um, or small reduction in wind speeds, um, even when we're getting to 100 meters above the sea. Here, the wind speeds are still about eight and a half meters per second. And then you have to get very close to the surface before the wind speeds drastic re drastically reduce. Whereas if we take another type of um, uh, surface characteristic, here we have a field, sort of quite open uh, landscape, we have this curve, so the, the reduction is more than it has been for the sea, and we see um, at 100 meters, the wind speed about 10, uh, around seven meters per second. And then likewise, we, we increase the roughness length. Here we have a town, and we follow with this curve B. So at 100 meters, it's more like um, six meters per second. And then the last case is over a forest, 
which is a very rough surface characteristic, and we see that the wind speeds have reduced even further. So now at the 100 meters, it's about uh, four and a half meters per second. So this is indicating the importance of the surface characteristic in the determining the wind speed profile. Another thing that affects the wind speed profile is the, the, the shape of the terrain or the orography. And here we have uh, a hill example, first as a schematic and then as a, a real hill in, in the landscape. When you look at um, this hill, we see an area of the, we see some flow before the hill and we see some flow at the hill top. And notice that the streamlines are more, have converged in this area and that means that there's a associated speed up related to that. When we look at the uh, profiles of wind speed with height, so a bit like we were seeing in the previous slide, we see this decrease of wind speed as we approach the surface. Um, when we look at the hilltop, we see that that profile is modified and you get a speed up effect due to these streamlines coming closer together. So you can see this enhanced wind speed associated, associated with the hilltop and this makes a favorable place to put wind turbines because you can make use of that increased wind speed. By the way, it's very indicative of a, a good windy site here when we see such flagging of, of a tree. So wind atlases that we can uh, use and um, are readily available are, are these ones. So um, we can look back in the uh, kind of history of wind atlases from DTU Wind and we see the European Wind Atlas that was published in 1989 as a book uh, and as a CD. Um, and now we've actually uh, changed the way we, we disseminate our um, wind atlases and we've had the new European Wind Atlas um, for example, and we've got the global wind atlas here, and we've got a global atlas of sighting parameters that looks a lot at the parameters that are related to um, turbine design. So in summary, in this lesson you have learnt about why assessing wind conditions is important, what features in the landscape affect wind conditions at different scales, and you have learnt about different wind atlases that are available.